Welcome back to another edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host. Well, we've got a really interesting show. We're going to talk to you a little bit about the Chicago Yacht Club's Chicago to Mackinac race, some of the accidents. We'll talk hopefully with some of the winners and um, get to uh, some of the stars of that race. Chris Duhon had his best showing in the 52 at Mockingbird. Certainly Stanford Burris's Maverick did a great job uh, beating Roy Disney's Paywack at 22 hours and change and beat the uh, overall speed record by about an hour and six. We're going to hopefully get a chance to talk to them on Friday in Port Huron. And uh, we certainly want to talk to uh, Dr. O'Neill on Natalie J, but they're competing in the Supermac, and we'll have that conversation, and we'll bring all that up. And then we're going to go and do a little bit of uh, investigation about the upcoming Bayview Yacht Club's Port Huron to Mackinac race, sponsored by National Fleet Services. And we're going to talk to, to three individuals about uh, the race and some very unique um, storylines. And I think that's something that I think you guys will enjoy. We'll split this up a little bit. Hard to believe, but there's a family, the Henry family. Of 100 years of racing at Bayview, there's been a Henry on a boat in 98 of the 100 Mack races. And then we're also going to get a chance to talk to uh, Bart Huthwaite about some of the folks who live on Mackinac. And uh, they're all going to be on the same boat. We'll have that conversation. I think you'll find that to be interesting. Uh, we're going to also get a chance to talk to uh, Eric Weintra, who's uh, the skipper and owner of Usual Suspects. That boat, uh, unfortunately, had a horrible accident with the spar breaking. And we'll talk to him a little bit about that. But uh, I think we've got a lot of insight, certainly a lot of good video from the Chicago to Mackinac race. And we'll bring that to you in uh, just a couple seconds.
Welcome back. We're talking with Chris Duhan, who just completed his uh, best race and part of the Great Lake 52 fleet. He's the owner and skipper of Mockingbird. Chris, great Mac, uh, race from Chicago and uh, your best race as, uh, as of recent times. And so congratulations. Talk a little bit about the race. Yeah, so um, I mean, the race, we kind of saw it setting up to be kind of an epic race. Um, uh, Mockingbird tends to do good or tends to do pretty well offshore um, within the fleet. We've been consistently second or third pretty much every distance race over the years that we finished. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is a tough fleet and you never know how it's going to shake out. Um, and I can break it down a little bit. You know, we knew we were going to go north fast. Um, with the system we saw in front of us, we didn't know where the storms would hit and who would get hit by them or if we'd be able to accelerate out in front of them. Um, which is kind of what happened. We got pushed enough to to get in front. Um, so all the way up to the storm, we were running 17s, 18s, 19 knots, boat speed um, with a great, you know, everything was downwind from literally the start until we took down the main up at the island. Uh, everything was up, uh, everything was downwind. So we were running triple headed stuff with a code, with our code zero up. And uh, the, the team just did an excellent job of keeping the boat flatten as best as you can and keep moving. Um, you know, for a while we were able to go up closer to the Wisconsin shore and, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really shocking how many times I've done this race uh, to be able to look over and see Racine <laughs> and you realize you're, you're coming up on Waukegan, you've already passed Waukegan, you know, and you're in Racine and it's the time of day. Usually you're not even close to it. Um you know, we passed pretty much most of the fleet uh, before the storm hit us. So it was only the big boats, a couple of big boats and us, um, as in the 52s. Um, so in the middle of the storm, we kind of got shuffled around a little bit. Um, at one point, we were heading like 88 degrees mag, um, which I was kind of grumpy about because I don't like reaching off the course. I like to keep going north. But we were going so fast, and every time we were trying to put up a kite, somebody was either wiped out below us or blocking us from doing that. Um, we were that tight racing. I mean, Maverick was below us for a while. Um, Nally J, Katana, Heartbreaker, uh, Winquest, they were all, we were all kind of lined up at different times, and sometimes people were on the, on the outside of us. So I think it was actually kind of lucky that we weren't able to put up a kite there um, because it kind of kept all of our group going to the shoreline and that kept us in front of, you know, we saw I think two or three puffs that were pretty brutal, you know, 45, 50, but they were short, short in duration. And uh, some of the guys behind us like Sagamore and usual suspects got hit by the same puffs at the wrong times. And, and like, you know, uh, usual suspects was in the middle of the sail change when that happened. Yeah. So unfortunately that, that that causes chaos and damage and we're glad everybody's okay um Chris, but after the storm went through it was a it was a full-on driving drag race um we chose to go outside the manitous when you're screaming that um, fast down had, do you worry is that the hardest point of sale on a, on a 52 is downwind going that kind of speed in terms of no actually the opposite if we were in, if we were banging into waves going up wind, that's the hardest point of sail okay. for the boat. For the, you know, the systems on the boat are, you know, the boat was built and designed to to reach and go downwind for the transpack right. Right. So okay. when we're full on in offshore mode, it's it's not easy on the team, but it's it's easier on the boat running with it. Um, oh, that that makes sense because the first fifty two built was built for Newport Beach, and everything you built for Santa Cruz is a downwind boat. And I lived in San Diego for twenty years. So everything's downwind. So I, I get that. I get that. I just think with that kind of power and that kind of load on, you know, backstage and other kinds of things, you would just think that obviously you got to pay attention on that boat at all times. There's no, you don't take a minute yeah. off. I mean, uh, I've got some great guys on the boat that, that know which shims to put in and how to set up the boat and the rig. And, and, and that's the big thing. It's like, you know, you know, even when we were, we went outside the twos with the heartbreaker and we had a jive for jive with them. For the entire run outside the twos, if you watch the tracker, you know, uh, we would put Heartbreaker away and then we'd jive away from each other, come back, and he'd be on starboard and I couldn't cross him. 
So, I mean, every time we thought we put him away, he gained back up. And then Katana came on the outside. So we some of the best sailing I've ever done was this downwind run at 20 something knots. Okay. With three boats, myself, Heartbreaker, Katana all lined up. And as we pop around North Manitou, you know, we could see it on the tracker, but it's it's so so much different to see it in person. And then we see, you know, Maverick, uh, Nally J and Wizard, and nobody's gaining. I mean, nobody's making trees on each other. Right. And we're coming in from different jives from, you know five miles, six miles apart. Right. It was pretty impressive sailing. Um, you know, for all the boats to beat the record that by Wackett set, it was pretty, pretty amazing run. Yeah. Um, so with sailing, breaking records also has to do with mother nature cooperating. That's also part of that same discussion. Yeah. You got to have the right horse for the course and, uh, the 52 when it's strong wind at you know, about 120 true is, is pretty much right in our sweet spot. Last couple of questions. You know, as this fleet gets stronger, you obviously have some serious stars on on those boats. You've got obviously Charlie Enright on Wizard. Ken Reed was on. You've got a couple of stars on your boat, Peter Eisler and, and Stu, who's a Volvo racer. And I, I always mis, mis, mispronounce Stu's last name. At a time. Yeah. I mean, you got two two rock stars on your boat as well. Um, does that give you more confidence as a, as a skipper to knowing that you got that kind of wealth of knowledge on board? Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to see how the fleet's progressed over the years. We've gotten better and better competitors, and um, and that's part of it. Uh, it definitely gives me more confidence of what we can do, but it's also more safety on the boat. Okay. Um, you know, it, 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 we were talking about loads and systems and things like that. I mean, the rigs are, are, are have to be protected on these boats. I mean, you can overpower the rigs quicker than most people know. And so having that kind of level of understanding of, both the weather that's coming in and and then how to how to use that as performance gain without breaking the boat is is a big deal. Now, at any time, any of us can break the boat. It, it if we have a mechanical failure, it's going to happen, you know. Right. Or you know, for usual suspects thing, it, it just unfortunate timing of when they got the gust. You know, um, all of that can happen to any one of us at any time. I mean, now the Jay's broken a rig. You know, it's happened to a bunch of us. So, um, but but to your point. Um, the competition, the level of competition has gotten so high that, you know, we used to joke, if you made a mistake, you'd lose a boat here. You make a mistake, you go from first to last or our fifth, you know, um, and, well, and even, that's even, even hooligan, their first time out. Yeah. Um, you look at what looks like a Corinthian crew and then you've got, you know, there's two Boston's on that boat. You got Curtis Florence, who's a former Rolex sailor of the year. That's not exactly, um, you know, weekend beer can guy. Those are, those are serious racers and they didn't have the race you guys had, but they were still, they were competitive, you know, up and down the lake. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, this was Stu's first Mac to start and finish with us. Um, but he's going around the world and it showed, yeah. you know, we've also got a guy, Nick Egnot Johnson that drove a significant portion of the night through, through part of the storm. Um, and he's a world match race champ, even though he's a young kid. Um, I mean, Stefano and, and, and those guys and Peter Eisler, of course, are fantastic sailors. So you've got this level of people and then you had amateurs like, you know, uh, Ryan Foley, Jason Artema that, you know, Ryan Foley was a triathlete. So he's on the handles all night long. Uh, Jason's a great, in your picture, Jason's right there hiking off and he's, you know, he's the front guy in the, in the, in, on your side, and um, he's been with me for a long time since I was racing 36 sevens, and it was his 25th max. So that plus David Tank and Mike Boucher, I mean, who kept the boat together, and David Tanks was on the Piwocket run. So, I mean, when you look at the guys and the experience, you've got to have a balance of knowing the, the boat you're on and being able to use that to knowing the lake, too. A little bit like F1. None of us are going to get in. A, average guy is going to get an F1 in the round. They just had the Grand Prix here in Detroit in June. I could get in the Grand. I could get in a, you know one of those cars and go, but I'm you know, I'm not going past fifty. And somebody <laughs> knows what they're doing. Obviously, he's going to you know do the do the job. But listen, it's a great race. Um, it's going to be maybe a little more docile. Matt coming up uh, on Saturday. Yeah, I don't think we'll uh, see the winning. same speeds. <laughs> What's that? Uh, I don't think we'll see the same speeds, but. Uh... But um, and also with the fleet we're in, I think there's 21 boats on our start line. So, you know, it's 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 kind of going to be a little tougher. I mean, safety on the start line is going to be a big discussion. 
because you know with 70s and us and 80s i mean it's it's we sail some different angles and it's always preferred to have us have our own start right. um but i but i do think you know the 100 running of bayview will be a uh, will be kind of an epic run um, well and it's also shorter way. Shorter yeah, by fifty shorter. miles, so that'll also yeah. change some of the dynamics in that. Yeah, but I think I, I'm guessing our. I haven't seen our run yet, but I'm guessing our our time over, you know, over the race will be similar, if not a little slower on Baby. Actually, even though it's shorter, I mean, we made, you know, uh, to make the entry of the Manitous after the first, you know, right before sunrise of the first morning. Uh, I've never even thought about doing that. I right. mean, no, no, I did. It was an exceptional race. There's no doubt. Yeah, thanks. You know, and, and it's funny, and and five or six of us beat the record. It wasn't just, you know, of course, Maverick said it. Right. But, it, you know, I mean, Windquest, uh, Heartbreaker, myself, Wizard, Katana, and, it, and Allie J all beat the record. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's pretty unheard of. I mean, we got there in time to shower up, have a, have a lunch, and hit the big pony, and then also hit the my guys. I took my guys up to the porch party. Um, because we've never been able to do that. That's kind of legendary. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, Chris, listen, best of luck. I appreciate you spending a couple of minutes with us. We'll hopefully see you up on the island if uh, maybe be grabbing that first place trophy and we can uh, have another couple of second chats. So thanks for your time. Well, I, I'd like to take it from uh, from Phil here. Um, a little rematch for me it would be nice to take it on his side since he took it on my side. There you go. <laughs> All right. Have Thank a great race. And we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate it. Uh, usual suspects. Uh, Eric, you had – obviously, you can see the boat behind me. With, I, don't think, I think you talked about an auto jack, a 30-knot puff with some 60, 80-degree shifts in it, tore down the yeah. mast. Just talk briefly about what happened and uh, where you are with it. Yeah, sure. We were kind of off to a tough start in the race. We actually had a very good start getting out of Chicago, uh, but an hour in, we peeled from an A1 kite to a – I don't remember. I guess it was A1.5. Uh, the – Takedown didn't go well. We shrimped the kite. Um, unfortunately, that stopped us dead. So we had a little, <laughs> little we handicapped ourselves getting out of town. Uh, we were starting to get back up to pace and felt okay about things, obviously acknowledging the deficit we'd created. Um, you know, late at night, the weather forecasters really did a good job. They they had it right, and we were totally expecting exactly what happened as a possibility. Um, with our new, you know, these new satellite comm systems, we had uh, the ability to watch weather in real time, you know, watching the radar closely, and you can maneuver your way through a lot of those little cells, but not all of them. And uh, there was one that was very unique. It was localized, and we have a screenshot of it, and it happened to be right where we were at the wrong time. So um, I had handed over the helm. I was below deck in my bunk at the moment. Um, but we were just smoking along at 15 knots, pretty normal stuff. And a TP-52, we had a, I think, an A2 kite, a Genoa Stasel, and a full main, and just ripping along on starboard jug. Um, the, the you know, there was a loud, loud crack of thunder and, and the flash of lightning, and they were just milliseconds apart. So we knew we were very close to a lightning thing. Um, and that woke me up. Um, but then what happened next, of course, was really traumatic, and that was... The sound that was unmistakably the the sound of an exploding carbon fiber mass. So that was it was it got it had everybody's full attention. Believe me, um, I went scurrying up on deck. Uh, Matt Dobrowski sent me back down to get my some safety equipment on, which was smart. Um, and then we just got to busy. You know, we got busy trying to figure out the situation first. We had to assess. You know, first of all, how many people are on the boat? Um, is anybody hurt? Is everybody okay? Do we have the safety bag handy? We have protocols in place for all this stuff, as you'd imagine. And, um, you know, what happened next was we all kind of stood there and just tried to get an understanding of the rhythm of this huge flailing piece of carbon fiber that was above our heads, you know, banging around in the in the air. So we want, we needed to remove it, but we had to time the removal. And uh, it wasn't as quick as just pushing the thing overboard. It's attached, you know, the, you've got shrouds, uppers, lowers, half a dozen halyards, you got all the electrical equipment in the rig. Um, there were a lot of things fighting against us being able to get unaffiliated with that equipment, which is super important to get away from the mast because it's laying in water, it's broken in several places and it's doing its best to poke a hole in the side of your boat in the meantime. So um, 
we grabbed Matt and I grabbed the hacksaw out of the tool bag and we just got busy cutting shrouds. But uh, the halyards, of course, were still all attached. And, you know, Casey went nuts with a saw and finally got them. But you don't know, like, which one, when I cut it, is this whole thing going to come crashing down? Uh, so staying out of the way of staying out of harm's way was an important element. Um, keeping everybody out of the way who could be out of the way other than who needed to hold the mass stable while Casey was cutting it. So, um, yeah, it was pretty wild. It was, we had a, we, like you said, it was an 80 degree wind shift. I think we were, the breeze went from 180 true to, you know, 260 or whatever. And, uh, with maybe about a 30 knot or 35 knot puff affiliated with that. So. The boat auto jived. Of course, the main sheet couldn't be blown because it was hung up on the running back stay as we had been on the other board. So, you know, what happens next is a roundup wipeout. We all know that. Uh, and that's OK. But it went down so violently and so hard and so fast that it just immediately broke in three places. So it was a mess. We had a lot going on. There's there's sounds on a 52. You you get humming from the, yeah. from the back stays. You get certain cavitation sounds from the bottom. But your, your point of when, you know, carbon fiber explodes, is, is it like anything you'd ever heard? I mean, it, sound, it was the same. It was similar to the thunder that I'd heard, just the big crack, you know, seconds before uh, the wipeout. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounded like a shotgun. It was just, it was loud. It was very loud. And it was not a good noise. There was raining carbon fiber all over the place. The deck was full of splinters. A lot of us got slivers just from trying to, you know, contain things. It was pretty wild. When the English boat ran over the Japanese boat and sailed GP a couple of years ago, they actually had this the, the end of that part where they had cut it off. And, and if you look at this, you know, this is a very small piece, but you realize the, the splinters that come off of that can, you know, can go through an eye, can go through, a, you know, I mean, dangerous stuff, especially at that speed. Yeah, for sure. That's why we just feel really fortunate that we, we didn't, nobody got hurt. So, yeah, so, we're lucky. Did you, lose, did you lose a sail as well? I mean, obviously you lost the rig, but did you lose a sail? Yeah, a lot, lot of them. Um, I mentioned right after the start, we blew up a kite uh, with a bad takedown. So there was uh, that was an A1 kite. And then uh, at the time of this event, of course, we had an A2 and a Genoa staysail and a mainsail. So those are all gone. Yeah. So yeah, four sails and a mast. But uh, it is what it is, man. You can't go back and do anything about it. I don't know what I would have done differently. There was It was so black out there that we just couldn't see uh, really much of anything in the sky or on the water to give us any indication um, we, you know, we had our digital equipment on deck and so we could watch for cells, but you can only do so much, you know, sometimes you're just going to get whacked. So we just had to take it. This is your 25th Mac. You would have been, you're getting, you're now an old goat. This is certainly going to be a story to remember, but this is also a season ending injury, so to speak. This is the end of, uh, yeah, just, for sure. Yeah. And you're not an old goat until you're approved to be an old goat, but I, but that was my 25th Mac and I'll start indeed. So didn't complete it this year, but, uh, that's the, that's just how it is. Is it required to be your 25th to complete it to go past the finish line, or is it just that you started it? Oh, I don't. I don't know. I haven't gotten into that. Uh, no, I, I, that's, I'm, that's I'm a trivial unclear. question. No, I yeah, get that. No problem. Not to, to get into the specifics, but there's a good chance that with this kind of a catastrophic, you know, accident, this you might not be able to, from just from a dollar standpoint, replace the replace the boat. So this may be a new boat if you can't find replacements, because this is a six figure fix, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's not a fix. I mean, like I said, we, you know, we cut the rig away in probably four or 500 feet of water. There's no getting that thing back. Um, but the, you know, the trick is some of these guys upgraded 52 masts over the years and, and their originals were kind of laying around, but those have all been gobbled up by other people like myself that have these catastrophic events. And then, so there's, you know, I'm on the prowl for a new rig, but I'm just not sure how that's going to go. I'm, I'm not aware of anything that's a plug and play option. That's for sure. So Building a new one wouldn't be practical because the boat is a 2008 boat. It's not new, and a new rig would be probably double the value of the of the entire sailboat. So it it's probably a total loss, I would think. But uh, we're just getting into that stuff. I know hindsight is easy, but has this spoiled you from wanting to get back to the fleet, or is this something that it's just a bump in the road, so to speak? No, nah, I mean, you know, I've sailed a lot of boats over a lot of years and with a lot of the same people. And I think all of us would agree, um, you know, so far, this has been the most fun experience that we've ever had in sailing. You know, we went into it knowing that we were just going to get clobbered by a lot of these pro teams. And that's kind of why we're doing it. It makes us better. And uh, that's really the fun part. I mean, I'm not sure what the next move is. And the 52s, it's kind of tough because, you know, the next step 
there's not an equivalent age boat really that you would replace mine with. You can go backwards a step and get an older boat, but that's only going to make it harder for us to be competitive. And the next step newer is a big, big step. And then you're playing the game with the, with these pro teams. Uh, I don't know. It, I, you know, we're not, our best scenario is just getting back where we were. And that's right. what we're going to try to do. We love the boat. We love the people in the class. Um, all the teams have been awesome to us. Every single one of the owners, even while while the race was still going on, by yesterday morning, by the time we hit Muskegon, I'd gotten texts from most of the owners in the class uh, who had already heard the news and uh, basically were just calling, you know, texting to offer their help or support in any way, tools, spare parts, whatever. So it'd be hard to walk away from all that. It's a really cool little group, and we're super excited to be part of it, and they've been really cool to us. So it'd be hard to leave that, and I, but I, I just don't know at the moment. If we can't find a mass, then what do you do, you know? No, and I understand it's a premature question. I was just yeah. in, your, in your heart of hearts, you know, kind of kind of thing. I'm with you, Greg. We're on the same thing. You know, it's it's your mind starts going on what do you where do you go from here? And I I don't I, yet have that answer, but I'm hopeful. Uh, I get that. When we were watching the race on Yellow Brick, I I dozed off and I picked my laptop or my my iPad back up and I saw you had made a right hand turn back. Yeah. And Laura Mum is is was a was one of the folks that does the communications for the race out of Chicago. So I have her phone number. I called her and she heard real quick. So we were one of the first guys to hear that what had happened and my heart sunk. I mean, it's just yeah. one of those crazy kind of things. Again, I've had a chance to say it with your crew and it's one of the best group of people I've been around in any sport. And uh, it's just one of those things that everything kind of goes with the nature of sport. Sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. But um, yeah, that's right. You know, last year we got to have our big fun and uh, you know, our unexpected victory in that class was a, a memory of a lifetime and you know again it, it was just mostly our regular group and and that was awesome um this year it went the other way and that's just part of what we have to accept well listen i wish you the best if there's anything we can do and uh thanks for a bunch of memories and i'm sure we'll we'll see each other over the trail but uh yeah for sure greg and next time i see i'll hand you a crew shirt it was raining the last time i saw you when you sailed with us at coming home from milwaukee in the queen's cup on the boat and we never got to that but uh we'll we'll, we'll make that happen and thanks for coming with us that was fun Thanks for the, to the best skipper I know in the, in the Great Lakes. So appreciate your time. Ah, that's a big honor. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. thank all the folks that were involved in the Chicago to Mac race. We'll have a couple more interviews from this weekend. We'll get a chance to catch up with the guys that are still on boats. We're coming up an interesting conversation with uh, Michael Hendry about being on a hundred Mac races. There are 98 of those have been uh, part of the Henry family. Bart Hathaway is going to talk about the guys that are on his 34 Catalina who are all members of the Mackinac Island Yacht Club. And that's a whole story in itself. And then we're going to talk to Brian Ellison. That's a whole unique story from the little club. I think you'll enjoy that conversation with Brian, and we'll talk and preview this race. We are, in fact, doing uh, the MAC this week. Coming up on Friday, we will be up in Port Huron. Saturday, we take off on Valkyrie, 53 Oyster. We'll have a whole video process next week of, of that race, and I think it'll be hopefully the, the highlight of my summer. 
And uh, Becquery is a charter boat uh, coming out of Cleveland. Welcome back. We're talking with Mike Hendry from Chicago. This is a couple of days before the Chicago to Mac race, but we're going to talk a little bit about the Hendry family. And the guy sitting behind me is George uh, Hendry, who is Michael's grandfather. And right. believe it or not, the, the second Mac race, which is what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Calvin Coolidge was president in his first term in 1924. There's been 90 of the 98 out of 100 races. The, the, the Henry family has had it said somebody in the Bayview Yacht Club's Port here in the Mackinac race. And I think that's astounding. I mean, it's just an amazing fact. We think about 100 years, an entire century. And um, you, I, I want to ask when you started sailing, because obviously it was when you probably were, you know, 18 months old. I think it was uh, a week when my dad sailed out, as I've been told. But then, you know, about four or five years old, we'd go and do the beer can race with him off uh, the city park. Uh, started junior sailing at 10 at the Little Club. Um, got more serious, moved over to Crescent at uh, 13. Did the, uh, the the formative years and the bulk of my junior sailing at Crescent through there and uh, taught there in the summers in college the, uh, the entire time as well. Is there a greater legacy of family in this race? than I don't think there's a, there, there can't be a family even close to the legacy you guys have provided. Yeah, if you did the uh, number of Henry sense number of races or yeah, added it up, uh, I would have to believe we, uh, we'd we be up there. I uh, don't have that data, but uh, it is pretty cool, I, and especially the span of it, going back to my grandpa having done the second race ever and, and us having an almost continuous time doing that through. Somebody's going to have to come up with an acronym. Obviously, you've got GOATS, and you've got guys for 25 and 50 years. There has to be another acronym for this year, completion that goes all the way back because I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing feat when you think about a hundred years and all the things that have gone on during that time. And this being the hundredth uh, consecutive year of run, of running the, the, the Bayview to Mackinac race by Bayview Yacht Club. I think it's pretty, pretty astounding. And do you, do, do you, does it, does it hit you that what the history of this is? Well, I've sort of always understood and appreciated the family history. It's the legacy and the reason I've always kind of done it. I think of myself as a little kid going to see, my dad off with my uncle George and Michael Jack and cousins on their boat white cap that they sailed for a long time in the eighties. And, you know, certainly it was, uh, the bug was put in me young, going to our family cottage in Port Huron, go down to boat night, watch the boats off. And me as a six, seven, eight year old kid saying, I want to go, I want to go, uh, eventually getting to do that at 16. And this will be my 30th race this year. And it'll be special to do it with, uh, six Henry descendants on our boat, six of the eight. Uh, and so you think about it in that context, there always has been that family pull from a young age and, in most races, there's five, six, seven Henry or Henry descendants that are up there. Uh, fam the whole family comes up. We've got a dinner for 21 of all family uh, on Monday night in the island. So there, there's a connectivity there that's special. I think it's something that it makes the race in particular uh, nostalgic. It, you always come back. You always see family. You always do it. And having that uh, the legacy and the history in it is neat. My Uncle George has got the record for the most uh, with 68. Uh, he passed away in January, and so we're doing that in his the, this race in his honor uh, with six Henry descendants on the boat. You know, anything with a mask, because if you look at the picture behind me with your dad, it's it's ice boating. He was a famous ice boater, and it was highly successful uh, in in the early days when ice boating was sort of just getting started. So obviously, it, he must have had something inside of him. He just couldn't do it in the summer. He had to figure out a way to do it in the winter as well. So sailing is a big part of that family fabric. It is. He grew up on Lake St. Clair, uh, sailing his own ice boat from seven, eight years old. It was kind of in his blood, both sailing and ice boating. And uh, I think the photo behind is Ferdinand the Bull. I know it is. It's Ferdinand the Bull in uh, the Stewart Cup, which he won for 10 straight years in, in the 40s. With uh, In the latter years, my Uncle George, his son, George Jr., uh, doing the trimming for him on it. And there's a 46-foot ice boat, went about 100 miles an hour, uh, designed it, uh, the, the legend has, with uh, Charles Lindbergh at the very space-age mast. And ultimately, in the 50s, when he got too old to do it effectively, he sold it to a young rising Buddy Melgus, and that family still owns the boat. Wow, that's amazing. Now, I'm going to switch out just so you can see what that's grandpa, but that's that's bull, and we should point out, you already kind of told the story. It's a J109, which you're racing. You've owned it about a year. You bought yep. it at well, uh, spring of 23. Spring of 23. It was a pretty successful boat prior to you owning it. It was called Callisto. Yep, and the only thing that changed is is really the owner and the side the side of the boat. Um, bought it from my good friend Jim Murray, fellow Gross Pointer. Uh, we grew up sailing together, and most of the Mac races, we've got at least four to five Gross Point natives and DRY alum, junior sailing alums 
on the boat, uh, most of whom moved to Chicago. Uh, but we've raced that for 14 years, and nothing's changed. I was a helmsman the last uh, large number of years. Do the uh, uh, all the buoy races here in Chicago, uh, the colors, the nudes, the verbs, and and the Mac and Chicago Mac typically on that. Um, you know, starting in 2010 when when Jim bought it. Uh, and he's moved up to uh, to other boats, and uh, I I purchased it, and we still have uh, the same crew intact. So very little has changed, uh, which is kind of neat having that continuity and the great friends, great people, and great crew. Just on a personal nam- nam- standpoint, your Gross Point South graduate, University of Michigan graduate, yep. you now run your own equity firm, if I'm not mistaken, called Expedition Partners in Chicago. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, private equity firm in in Chicago, Expedition Capital Partners. Like- Gives you a little bit of time and opportunity to sail in the summertime. Are you an ice boater at all? I grew up ice boating at a DN. And so at a young age, would, would go with my dad and do it in high school. I did, uh, starting in eighth grade, it's probably the first time I raced, raced through high school a bit. But yeah, after that, it, it kind of, I moved away and hasn't been ice boating uh, in the blood since. I'd love to get back to it living in Chicago. Uh, it, it's less opportune. J109 is is certainly a fast boat, uh, a little more comfortable maybe than 111. Is that a fair statement? It is. Uh, the, the 105s and the 111s down below are very barren, kind of race focused. Uh, the 109 is sort of that intersection where you can race very competitively and your wife likes the boat as well. And you've already won some stuff. You've already won some races uh, this year and last year with the, with the same boat. Uh, we did. I think the Heli Hansen 1 design was a, a big regatta so far this year. We had a, a, a good good result there the first place finish so we're very excited for that now we're a couple of days away from the chicago to mac race and we'll, i just want to talk briefly about that but tell me what is the, the intriguing part as you pointed out it's family on the bayview race you know like huron what is it you like about the race and now this year it's a little bit different because they're going to go with the original 1925 course which is about 215 miles so what's that i think it cuts off about 20 miles from the uh channel. no no it cuts off uh, it depends always if you go nautical or regular miles Cuts off about 50. Oh, okay. Typically, I think it was 202 nautical versus 259 on Coal Island. Okay. So just talk briefly about what, what's been your experience, why you, what, you know, what's what's the deal about, what do you like about the Mackinac race? We're talking Bayview. I think it goes back to what I said earlier on tradition, and, and that that's something that kind of pulls you back, I think, it is relevant. The race itself, I mean, it, it's in my blog, going to boat night uh, from when I could walk and remember it. And, you know, my friends and I – same guys from high school that race, we race together. We still go, go to it. We go to the family cottage uh, in, in Port Huron, the same family cottage that's been there since the 1920s. Uh, you see the whole family, uh, go down, see the boats, go see your friends, go to the, uh, the Port Huron Yacht Club party. And then the race in of itself, especially going to the Blue Water Bridge on the way out. There's always a, the, kind of the pageantry uh, with that. And then there's the sport part. You, you get into racing mode and you go hard. And I, I think... It's a great, it's a unique challenge. Um, sailing at night is always a pretty special thing. Hang out in, in the lake, the short courses we're doing this year, it's got its own charm. Uh, the Cove Island has its unique challenges that uh, are, you know, I, I think, used to be navigational. Now it's just a little bit more, uh, I think, a breadth of conditions you're going to get in, down and up and all that. Um, it, it's a special race. As a Michigan native, uh, that, that always stays in your blood, too. And so kind of coming home and, I think there's nowhere more beautiful than the Great Lakes and, and, and great sailing out there. And when you get to Mackinac, I think, as, as we all know, everybody has a great time. And that's, uh, you know, I think there's a, a rite of passion, a tradition. You come back to the same place every year and see the same folks. That's that's neat. You have three children. Are they involved in sailing? They uh, they did junior sailing this year. They've done it a little bit in the past. And I think next year is when we get them amped up a little bit more aggressively that they are excited to do. And I've effectively brainwash them like I was once that they come down to the boat and see it and they say, I want to go on that race soon too. And so, you know, we're, we're getting them trained and hopefully in, you know, five, six years, I can have uh, the kids on there. You know, we've talked on the show so much about what's different about sailing, the social fabric that comes to it, the, the families and the parties, yep. um, even somewhat the, 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 cl- the clicks in, in clubs, guys who've raced since, you know, since they're in, since they're juniors. And part of that becomes, important because guys can be competitive internationally at an older age and that's not true in any of the sport so i think when you have that sort of competitive streak the rest of it kind of comes along because it's a it is a relatively small audience in yep. terms of, so they you, you kind of bond with each other i think that's part of it because you see each other uh you know in certainly in michigan and chicago at least half of the year and you know it kind of provides that that great environment 
Yep, absolutely. Couldn't uh, couldn't agree more. So that's the big race coming next week. You're getting geared up for leaving. Do you guys leave tomorrow or, or Saturday for uh, the Chicago Yacht Club's race to match? We're, we're a Saturday start. Okay. So we'll be down tomorrow getting the boat ready, get down to the Yacht Club, get all your stuff, go to the skipper's meeting. Uh, and Saturday morning, we're off. You've been looking at uh, wins. I'm just curious because we're going to, this show will, will probably get on the air before the race is finished. So we're, what's the race look like? It's going to be a pretty competitive race. Winds are high or low or? It looks like it was pretty, pretty decent wind out of the South to begin with. Got a pretty warm day on Saturday. And once you get up the lake, it, it's too hard to predict that many days out. I think uh, a lot of folks do. That's often a fool's errand and a kind of a waste of, waste of energy because it changes so much. Uh, right now it does look fast, uh, Southern breeze. Uh, but who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll keep checking. I never get ahead of myself. Those things change so frequently in the last 24 hours. With the record number of entries at 335, it'll be interesting. I think the biggest problem is going to be everybody trying to figure out a place to park once they get past the finish line up in uh, up at Mackinac. Well, they, uh, they're going to have to kick people over to St. Ignace in uh, Mackinac City. So we're supposed to find out doc assignments tomorrow. So I've, uh, I'm kind of nervous yeah. about that. Do not want to be in one of those spots. <laughs> and they, they said, I, I just read that I, we probably got the same uh, email, is that I think they're going to wrap them five wide, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Something yep. to that. And in the Black River. Oh my gosh, that'll be horrible. That that's yep. a lot. That's a lot of bodies. Well, listen. We wish you the best of luck. It's going to be a, an epic race, to say the least. We wish you the best of luck in Chicago, and uh, hopefully, we'll uh, see you what I think will be as good a party as they've had at the Mackinac for the Bayview Yacht Club in a long time, with a hundred years behind them. I think it's going to be epic. Well, thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. We're talking with Bart Huthwaite. We're sitting here at uh, Jefferson Beach Marina, out uh, a couple about a week away from the Mackinac, the hundredth. Bayview Yacht Clubs, port here in the Macross, sponsored by the National Fleet Service. We've got to get that one in. Mm-hmm. We're going to have an interesting conversation because this is going to be like a jigsaw puzzle trying to put it together, but it revolves around your shirt, which says Mackinac Island Yacht Club. So I'm going to try to not explain it because if I do, I'm going to mess it up. Plus, the information I got some of it isn't exactly crazy. So a bunch of people from Mackinac Island are getting together on your 34 Catalina, which is a beautiful boat. Thank you. Explain to me what it is that you're all doing and how it all works. All right, so last year, probably right around this time, maybe it was after last year's race, I was in the Pink Pony, of course everybody knows where that is, and Jason St. Ange approached me. Jason St. Ange is the fire chief on the island, he also owns the Cannonball Oasis. If you've ever ridden around Mackinac, you know where the Cannonball is, it's out there for a fried pickle or an ice cream cone. So anyway, Jason approached me and he just realized that it was the 100th Mackinac, and he had never sailed in one of the Mackinac's in his life, and so he figured if this is the time, this was the time to do it. And so he came up with the idea to have an all Mackinac crew, and originally it was going to be Dan Musser, who recently sold the Grant Hotel, and then Mike Gidley, who's a past Commodore of the Mackinac Island Yacht Club, Mike Haggerty, who's the current rear Commodore of the Mackinac Island Yacht Club, myself, the treasurer, and my son and so unfortunately Dan had been bow out and so we recruited Andrew Dow and Dowd of course owns Dowd's Market along with a uh, bed and breakfast on Market Street and his wife owns a couple stores as well so two of those guys uh, Jason and Andrew both grew up were born and raised on Mackinac and are there year-round very very connected with the island Mike Gidley has a uh, place on the island, and he's been very connected since the early 80s on Mackinac. He met his wife up there and has very strong love, obviously, for the island. So he's got a summer place up there. He's retired now, and he's spending his summers up there. Charlie, uh, I'm sorry, Mike Haggerty, his family has had a cottage on the island for over 100 years. And my family has been going to the island for 36 years. My mom used to have a store on the island. And uh, so that's our connection to the island. Okay, so if I've got the puzzle right, mm-hmm. it's an unbelievable connection to Mackinac Island. Correct. And certainly the Mackinac Island Yacht Club. Yes. It's either business or you've had some connection to there for your entire lives. And this is going to be, I got this has got to be a first, right? I think it is a first, yeah. Jason uh, looked into it, and I don't think it's ever been done. There's definitely other club members who are in the race, but this is the, all Mac, the only all Mackinac crew. I think it's a cool idea, and what makes it cool for this show is that earlier in the show, you guys had a chance to see 
uh, a gentleman and a family who's been in 98 of 100 max. And coming up, you'll be able to chance to see a, a guy who's on a, a 46 uh, Ericsson and a, a unique story. So these are three really individual stories that are, that are kind of cool. Now, you guys are all friends, I'm assuming. Absolutely. We've not, you know known each other for as long as we've all been up there. So 35, 36 years for me. And I'm really looking forward to spending some quality time with these guys. What was the genesis for this? Just a just a conversation. Just a conversation in the Pink Pony has a lot of things starting, of course. Right. Actually, my father um, used to be the owner of the Bernita, which was the boat that won the very first Baby to Mackinac. Wow. So he found that in a barn and got the restoration process started. And that conversation started at the Pony too. So a lot of crazy ideas started the Pony. Of course, the Bernita went on to um, Al DeClerc ended up racing that in the 75th and won the race overall. So, a lot of great things happened at the point. Okay. Now, you guys are going to be on the starting line. It's going to be a party night on Friday. It's going to be a big race. You're also a part of the Mackin Island Yacht Club. Yes. Which may be more exclusive than Augusta National Golf Club. And so my point to that is, is that you guys are members you told me there's a 30-year waiting, waiting list. You have no slips on the island. But talk a little bit about the club. The club's a unique place. It, it originally started as a house, the Sweeney's house, and uh, I believe it was 1937, if I'm not mistaken, that the club took it over. It's got eight rooms, and so those are available to members and guests outside of the high season. We have no slips. Um, there's no bar, there's no restaurant, and so in lieu of a bar, we have liquor lockers. And so the club puts out all of the condiments for drinks or what have you, and then we have our liquor lockers, and we make our own cocktails, and then we have a very nice dinner on Thursday nights and brunch on Sundays. It's managed by Tim McCleary, a very dear friend of mine. He's run the club for 20, uh, this will be his 22nd year, I think. My dad hired him way back when, when he was Commodore. So we all are very passionate about the club. We love it very much. A 30-year waiting list is pretty impressive. How does he get to 30 years? Just because it, everybody hangs on? We're maxed out at 310 people. Okay. And so the club's just not that big. It doesn't have, we don't reciprocate with other clubs just because we don't have, have a lot of amenities. It's not a huge place, so we want to make it usable for the members that do exist so that they can get a room if they want a room so that they can enjoy the porch and it's not overwhelmed and so it's it really does feel like your house when you're staying at the club and so we have 310 members and it's basically based on attrition okay so i don't want to sound dumb but explain to me where it is is in reference to maybe the grand hotel or the fort it's right across from the harbor you can't oh, miss it okay. so uh, when you look up from the harbor you're going to see a gray building with red awnings and that's the Mackinac Island Yacht Club. It's got a big anchor in the front of it. You can't miss it. Can I assume that if I were to go into Saving Miss or Mackinac City, that if I were looking for a room, the prices would be much higher retail than they might be in the middle of July at the Mackinac Island Yacht Club? 100%. That is definitely one of the benefits of being a member. They are very affordable rates at the club, and we try to keep it that way so that folks can come up and enjoy the island, and a lot of folks return year after year, reserve the same week. Weekends. So, <clears throat> yes, it's very affordable. I have to think that occupancy works against your 30-year wait list. There's got to be some correlation between those two. Yes, definitely. It's it's tough. The, the season's pretty well sold out. You need to, I just There's a lottery for 4th of July, so I just won the lottery for the next year, for next year to get a room. I don't even need a room. We have a place on the island, but I just thought it would be good to have one. So. One of the things we're exploring in this story is the camaraderie that goes with sailing mm -hmm. and the sort of social culture that maybe doesn't exist in other sports. You're racing, but it's really about spending quality time with friends. Is that fair? Definitely fair. We have no um, aspirations of being first over the line or winning our class. We are really looking to do this as a memory, you know, creating memories, having a great experience. I think it's going to be really neat for my son to get to know my friends better and, you know, be able to meet them on the street. As we speak, about a day ago, they let out the dock um, options for when you finally get to Mackin Island. I'm just waiting to see what it's going to look like. I've got a picture, an aerial picture from last year over the harbor. This is going to be, I think the biggest problem with this race might be where you park your boat when you get there. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. I actually haven't looked. I heard they were supposed to come out today, so... I don't know that I, I hope I'm on the island, but I could be a Max City or Sedateness. 
but assured that I will find his place on the island if that's the case. And then I do have a morning, so I can always talk to Okay. <laughs> we are on Sea Dock, which is which turns out to be okay. So at least we get our the I guess the bigger the boats, they must give them a little more priority, not because of their bigger boats, but because it's just harder for them to park. Right. I would think there'd be some easier to raft off to. <laughs> I, I would not want to be the harbor master in that job and trying to figure out where all those boats are going to go. Because I got to assume that some of those boats are going to have to end up in my, back in a city in St. Ignace. Absolutely. There's no yeah. way 300 boats can go no. into the harbor, can they? No, definitely not. So it would be interesting to see a 2020 picture after the Bayview and yeah. then this year because it was empty when we were there yeah. in 2020. Well, it's the first time they've gone over 300 since the 80s. Right. So I think 81, 80, 81, and 87, they were over 300. And now this is the first time, and the 2020 race, I think, was, if I'm not mistaken, around 150? Yeah. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. It's pretty light. One, what is one provision for, for a social race of, of sorts? What, you read provisioning for next week already? Oh, absolutely. In fact, Dowds is taking care of that for us. Andrew has graciously offered to take care of the provisioning. We're going to focus on a little prime rib. Apparently, we have a pasta dish for the first night. There's some debate amongst the crew about how much beer to bring, but I won't okay. be touching that. So. Since I don't have any financial investment in your boat <laughs> or this show, you have four sponsors? We do have four sponsors. And those four sponsors are also connected to the crew? Partially, All yeah. Right. So the first sponsor was Arnold Freight, and Dan Musser is a, an owner in Arnold Freight, so I approached him first, and he was very gracious to offer to help support. The second one was Mission Point. And um, they're a, a huge supporter of racing. Liz Ware, who owns Mission Point, is a huge supporter of racing and sailing in general. And so she was very, very gracious to match Arnold Freight. And then when we got Andrew on board, I, uh, I decided to hit him up. And of course, Cannibal Oasis came aboard as well. Basically, we may not be first, but we're going to be a pretty good, pretty uh, maybe the best dressed crew around. So it's for gear. Uh, I got a new head sail. I have a new bowsprit on board, so we'll see how it goes. Maybe you can charter next year. There you go. <laughs> I want to make sure you got a chance to at least talk to your four sponsors, at least get them mentioned. Absolutely. We will try to put their logo up as you're speaking, up around the side. That would be fantastic. Give them a little, get a little bit. Yeah, they would and appreciate that. I think this is going to be a lot of fun for you. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it. Last question. You're going up uh, Friday, Thursday? When you end up to support Yard? I think I'm going to take the boat up on Sunday and leave it at the Port Huron Yacht Club for the week maybe run up there a couple times just to tweak things but I have to work next week so trying to find the time to get it up there is a bit of a challenge. That's a long that's a long that's a long ride. It is. Well, we wish you the best. I appreciate Thank you taking you very a much. couple of seconds for taking out and talking with us and uh, hopefully maybe we can have a conversation on the island after we figured out that you uh, won your cruising class. Come join me at the club. It'd be great to see you. Absolutely. Thanks for your time. Right. Thank you very much. Just wanted to briefly thank Chris Duhon and kind of slipped him in late after the show was finished but we got a chance to mention the uh, second place finish in the Chicago to Mackinac race, sponsored by the Chicago Yacht Club. And we also want to thank Bart and um, Michael for talking to us about your rather unique versions of the Bayview Yacht Clubs for here in the Mackinac race, sponsored by National Fleet Services. Up next is Brian Allison from the Little Club, the Gross Point Club. Uh, we talked to Brian about a, a different version of how you get into the race with a big boat. I think you'll find this to be a really interesting story. And, not everybody has to start sailing uh, at an early age. I think Brian brings that out, and I think you'll enjoy the story and certainly uh, everything that goes with that. So hopefully it'll be fun. Welcome back. We're talking with Brian Ellison here at the Gross Point Club, which is sometimes known as the Little Club. We're sitting on his beautiful 46-foot Sabre, which you're going to race next week in Bayview Yacht Club's annual port here in the Mackinac race, the 100th race. That's right. It's got to be pretty exciting. Obviously, this is Friday before the race. You're doing lots of work on the boat, so... First of all, th thanks for taking the time. Thanks for coming out. And uh, this is an unbelievable view. I thought we had good views at Crescent, but it uh, looks a little bit like Rhode Island as you're coming out, uh, out, out the lawn. A little bit. It feels that way, too. We're gray a lot. We got a little bit of that, you know, that vibe. So talk about the race coming up and kind of what you're getting ready for. Well, uh, as you said, it's the 100th, you know, Port Huron and Mackinac race, Baby Yacht Club Mackinac race. Um, it's the second race that we're running on this boat. I like to think that compared to last year, at least this boat is uh, is better prepared and improved. Uh, the crew has had another year to uh, to work on it, um, not only working on the boat itself, but sailing it, sailing as a team. We have some members that 
left. You know, it's the hundreds, so we lost them to family family race teams, et cetera, right. et cetera. But we have uh, we've constituted a new team, and uh, and we're feeling comfortable, and, and we're excited, we're ready, ish. <laughs> we're gonna kind of go through the chronology, your history of being starting sailing when you're 12, but you went from a 28 saber to a 46 saber. They're correct. They're, they're different animals, and this got to be a lot more work to get ready for a race than a 28 does. No doubt. So. I never raced my 28 foot uh, saber. It was a, uh, a passion project. It was a consistent work in progress, something that I cruised around on, and then I was fortunate enough to sail with other people and other teams, and um, you know, and, and be on the water both of those ways. But you know, when I got a hold of this boat, um, it was an interesting story. It was during COVID. Uh, I was down in Florida um, with my family and saw this boat for sale in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and it was in disrepair. And you know, we, a lot of us have these stories. Um, in this particular case, there was water in the hall. There was an offer out there, or a request, or a price. And uh, I, I went over, talked to the broker. I said, "Hey, what's the problem?" He said, "There's water in the hall from the from the bow, probably to the mast." Uh, I called another buddy of mine that I'd gone to the Naval Academy with, who uh, who now owns a, a boat building firm out in Rhode Island. Asked him. I said, "Hey, Britt." Was it takes to fix this? He gave me the number. I went back to the broker. I said, I will take this boat regardless of what else is on this inspection, but I know that this is the price. Can we do it for that? Took it to the owner. We got it that way. I sent it over, uh, well, I trucked it up, sailed it over to Muskegon, took it to Torreson, and uh, they did an amazing job and they, they got me all squared away. So I feel like we're ready. I feel like uh, you know she's she's, Definitely seaworthy, definitely prepared, and definitely better than my 28. Fair to put a point on that you could probably got this distress boat a little cheaper than it would have been a, a brand new 40s, 46. Ab absolutely. So, yeah, the Sabre 452 was their flagship. Um, and, you know, finding it, I feel, I, I, I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world. Yeah. It's a boat that I've, I've always admired and loved. I saw it down there, and, you know, it just it was a situation that allowed me to get access. Are you handy? Pretty handy. Okay. Yeah. Thank God for that. That was uh, arguments. If you watch the show at all, I'm, I'm the, I have no male skills at all. I can't find oh, a nail straight. <laughs> Cook great, but I can't. So getting something like this, I'd either have to have a lot of money or a serious uh, crew to help be able to help out. So oh, and a, I do. This have boat's a, in beautiful shape. Thank you. And my crew is amazing. I've got I've got guys on here, um, some with extensive sailing experience, some with no sailing experience. But my guys on this boat with no sailing experience have phenomenal mechanical experience. Okay. Um, I've got engineers that are on my team. You know, we've rewired everything and put in new, new MFDs, new radar, you know, one the reason, we've done it. One of the reasons we're talking to you is that you've got a unique background. We're trying to give a different perspective. Not everybody's been racing since they're three years old and they start sure. small boats. Your godfather got you involved at the age of 12 on bigger boats. That's right. You really don't have any small boat experience. That's correct. But you've kind of gone from Southfield High School, Lathrop, to North Farmington, to certainly Annapolis for a couple years. Yep. Eventually worked your way out through it. I'm going to ask you about your... your your professional background in a second, sure. but you kind of come at this, even though you've sailed most of your life, you come at this as a little different perspective of the boat of this nature. So it's kind of cool. You can really, if, you, if you're sitting home watching TV, you're a perfect example how pretty much you can have a dream if you want it. Exactly right. Um, you know, at 12, I had to set, I, I set foot on my, my godfather's tartan. We went out sailing one time and I was like, this is what I want to do. I love doing this. Um, I want to be out as much as I possibly can. Um, he didn't have any aspirations towards sailing. He came to sailing about the same time I did. Um, and so we kind of learned together. And it was all in cruising Lake St. Clair, Lake Erie, and a little bit in Lake Huron. And, um, you know, from there, I kind of ran with it. So if I had an opportunity to sail some more, I did. Um, obviously, as, you know, as a plebe in Annapolis, we did small boat sailing um, just as a skills course, right? Right, all right. Um, and then when I, you know, when I came back home, um, I had opportunity to sail with guys uh, out of Toledo. I was sailing uh, an S279, a Hobie 33, just trying to learn as much as I possibly sure. could. And then, you know, and that was racing a little bit. Um, they were all good racers. And then it's just a matter of how much can I learn, how much can I learn. Other than that, you know, I was very interested in cruising. And I've been able to sail the tartan I grew up on from Boston to Martha's Vineyard a few times. It got trucked out there. Um, I spent about six months as a charter skipper in the British Virgin Islands, sailing, you know, a 47-foot catamaran and did some deliveries. So I have a lot of cruising experience. I can get from A to B, um, but I am constantly trying to learn more and more about racing. 
I can tell you from doing the show when you're starting to have those conversations with Russell Coots and Terry Hutchinson, you think you know a little bit about something. <laughs> and you got on the boat back of a 52 like we did for the Queens Cup, and you realize, I know a lot about about other things, but boy, it's fun to learn. Exactly right. That's kind right. of the point. You know, and that's and oddly, that's how I got into it. So my that was my godfather's position. He was an engineer. He wanted something that he could learn, but he liked to tinker and he liked to work on, you know, sail shapes and these things because it was things that were familiar to him right. and he could apply it in the real right. world. And so, yeah, there's always something to learn here. Always another thing. I'm curious as I look around the little club, and I'll use that term because that's what Perfect. it's There's three sailboats. So this is not necessarily, as I look north to Crescent, my place, which is all sail. Oh, yeah. You're kind of a, an odd duck here in this particular place with only three masts up. There's no doubt about it. Uh, to be fair, proof is here. She's uh, she's out racing. Okay. Uh, she's doing Chicago to Mac. Four. So that's four. <laughs> it's still <laughs> a little on the short side. We're on the short side. Um, I was the Commodore of the club last year, and in jest, I told them, you know, whenever new members come, we just need to make criteria that your boat is a sailboat. That is what we're going to do. Uh, <laughs> that didn't fly, uh, <laughs> oddly. But, um, but yeah, you know, there's not many of us in here, um, but we're well supported by the club. And, you know, our members love to see us racing, like to see us out there. But this has just been a club that, uh, uh, you know, I've been here six years and five years, and um, it's always been this way, as long as I know. Now, there are people that can go back, and they say, oh, no, we had, we had tons of sailboats. We had a lot of sailboats. Right. They're looking back 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. The sport's growing, but not the way we want it to grow necessarily, and that's another conversation for sure. another day. Junior sailing programs are down, and it's, there's a cost of entry is part of that discussion because – boats like this are, are expensive explain just briefly yeah the challenges from having a 28 to a 46 the weight differences the size differences what kind oh, of the challenge it was to learn just to be comfortable on this you know that's something that happens overnight fair that is fair i mean there are still things that i were were i'm i'm making adjustments even today as to how i would have sailed on any of the other boats that I own. I had a Tartan 30 and I had a Sabre 28 and a Tanzer 27. Um, but you're talking about, you know, exponential changes in, in wet, in width, you know, and you're talking about exponential changes in weight and momentum. Um, obviously my sail plan is significantly larger and more powerful than anything else. And automatic, everything's running. hydraulic. Yeah, we have electric winches on this, on this boat. To be fair, not necessarily something I would have sourced, but nice to have. Right. Um, no, 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 they're great. You know, and it's just your calculations are similar but different, right? Like I, I want to obtain the same objectives, but I have to take a lot of different factors into account. The weight between a twenty-eight and a forty-six is how much? Just ballpark. I guess oh, the twenty. I had to guess. This weighs how much? Twenty-six thousand five hundred pounds. Okay, so it's got to weigh somewhere in the eight thousand pound range. I think 28, that's right. So. It's not only just your head, what you see, you're moving lots of inertia as well in the terms of Absolutely. that takes that takes a little bit, little bit of a getting used to in terms of the driving. Without a doubt. So both under sail and under power. Do you worry about bigger winds or have you got comfortable enough on the winds get higher? You know, we actually prefer it, to okay. be honest. Um, it's twenty six thousand five hundred pounds. And so um, this boat thrives um, in lumpy seas okay. and bigger winds. Um, you know, at first, when I first got the boat, it was a little disconcerting. I mean, you're talking about so much sail area and how do I adjust my sails such that I'm not overpowered, that I have this boat under control because that does start to feel, when you get on that edge, it feels a little scary. Um, but here we are, you know, after three years, three seasons, full seasons of sailing, it's very comfortable and she's, you know, very responsive. You know, and in my mind, safe. She takes care of us. We did the Queen's Cup on the back of a 52 in the rain for seven hours. I'm going up on this Mac on an Oyster 53 Beautiful. with air conditioning, a fireplace, and cold, a cold refrigeration up to have ice cream. So wherever the, wherever the, the, the <laughs> easiest seat to sit is, I'm going to have a cushion under my ass. Oh, there's no doubt. I'm going to sit at the back of the boat. <laughs> and I'm not going to struggle in any way. We've got some other races coming up on the it's got some buoy races coming up for the Ugata Regatta. So we'll be there. It's just part of that premise. I just you know, you want to in, enjoy the enjoy the ride. So what is it you're looking that. forward to for the hundredth race? Because it's kind of special. You know, um, again, this is number six. I don't you know, I don't have the old go twenty-five year track of experience. And I mean I have young guys around me that have that kind of experience. And um, for me, for me, I'm now looking at it as, wow, there was course selection 
in the in my previous five years now we're all on the same course um that's interesting the number of boats that are going to be out here is interesting you know the weather patterns here are always interesting those things change every year but this being the hundredth um you know those changes to the course the size of the classes and the size of the overall grouping um i think is gonna make this really exciting i mean it gives us a lot to kind of directly compete against you know sometimes you're just out there and you're kind of making your way here i think that you're going to see a lot of more direct competition with a shorter race because they're going to the 1925 course right. which is about 45 miles shorter than what the original course if you take the um if you take the longer course the traditional longer course i think the biggest single challenge is going to figure out how to put 335 boats someplace in the greater Mackinac island area oh you're not kidding i think it's going to be <laughs> rafting out you're going to walk 12 <laughs> boats across to get to your to just to get to your boat. Oh, there's no doubt about it. And Parking I think if you have to go to the nuts. bathroom, you may be going off the side because you don't want to have to walk 12 miles across boats exactly just right. to get back. If that's the worst, that's not a bad thing. Oh, no. We're all, you know, at the end of the day, we've all just raced these boats and we're up in Mackinac. I mean, you know, yeah. everything, everything, you know, is relative. <laughs> well, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. And it was appreciate talking to you. And I think it'll be fun. Uh, we get up to hopefully get to Mackinac where we can have another five minute conversation for our, our real, our actual results show. Oh, that would be great. I would, I would love to have you out. Ryan, thanks. My pleasure. Thanks, Greg. Well, I think all our guests, is going to be an epic Mackinac race coming up on uh, Saturday. Inside Great Lake Sailing will be on Valkyrie and Oyster 52. And that's uh, we'll bring you a whole story on, on, on our experience, having been in a 50, GL 52 on the back end of one for the uh, Queen's Cup. This will be a little more comfortable ride, and uh, we think you'll enjoy it. You can see this picture here. We just thought we would uh, – I was told that I need, I have my safety equipment, but I was told I need a knife as part of that process. We have a knife on my own boat, but I got to carry one. So we thought we'd bring uh, the real deal. So I'm not sure it's the right size, but uh, I'm sure the guys will let us know in Port Huron if this works or doesn't. But anyway, we look forward to a great party on Friday night in Port Huron. We certainly look forward to a great race and a great opportunity. We get a chance to spend some time with Dwayne Burgoyne, who was lucky enough to finish the um, Chicago to Mac race on uh, Fuzzy Logic. And congratulations to Dan Emery and all the folks on that boat. They, uh, they had a great race. And uh, we look forward to this being a bucket list. And I think I got to tell you that I've mentioned more than once that I'm not a racer, but the more and more I cover sailing with this show, the more and more I realize just how much these people love the sport they do. I've been a sailor my whole life, but certainly not a racer. I've gained so much respect for the integrity they bring to the sport. And, um, Hopefully we can spend some time and enjoy the uh, party on Mackinac. And if you see us walking around with a camera, say hello. So for fair winds for the folks coming up from Port Huron and all the guys at National Fleet Service, I want to make sure I stick that in for uh, the guy, <laughs> guys sponsoring the race. But we'll see you in. Uh, we'll see you next week with hopefully a huge story from uh, Mackinac Island and from Port Huron. So appreciate you spending some time. For the guys in back, we'll see you next time.